Welcome to the ultimate beginner's guide to that crazy adventure. This is a video that I didn't really think that I had to make, so I never intended on making it at all. But after getting a fair amount of people basically asking, where's the beginner's guide for this game? I figured, hey, it can't hurt. So let's put one together. The basic controls for the game are all showed off right on the menu before you even start playing. As for when you start playing, there's a few things you're going to want to do right off the bat. The first is to hop into your settings, which is located on the right side of your screen. If you click it, it'll open up a menu and then you can go to the settings. There's a variety of options in here that you're going to want to tailor to your preferences. Personally, I can't stand screen shake, so I get rid of that, as well as the time acceleration effects, which I just think are really annoying, so I disable them. There's also a section for keybinds where you're able to rebind a variety of things such as your block key, your sprint key, your shift lock key, etc. So before you do anything, set these to your liking and then we'll get to the actual game itself. The first thing that's going to happen when you spawn in is you're going to have a quest marker telling you to go talk to Rohan. This will get you started on the storyline of this game. So that's exactly what you're going to do. You'll talk to Rohan, he'll task you with talking to Koichi, and after talking to Koichi, this is where we get into fighting for the first time. These school thug enemies are stupid easy to beat, and nowhere close to as much of a beginner's trap as YBA's security officers can be. Basically, if you mash M1s, you will win. No questions asked. But that's okay because this section of the game isn't designed to teach you about anything other than just mashing M1 to win. After you've finished up with that, you'll head back to Rohan, and then he'll ask you to go get him a cup of coffee. Simple fetch quest, go get it, come back. Now after returning to Rohan, that's where he'll tell you that he wants you to go talk to Jotaro. But before you do that, he gives you a coupon in order to go talk to the shopkeeper. When you head across the map and talk to the shopkeeper, this is when you'll finally get your first stand. The shopkeeper will give you 20 items, 10 rokas and 10 arrows. Arrows give you a stand, rokas take it away. Simple stuff. There really aren't any bad stands in TCA aside from Killer Queen, so as long as you don't get that, you're probably going to be in good shape. If you want to try to use the rest of your 9 arrows and rokas in order to get something else, you can do that, but I would hold off for now at the very least until you get your first stand storage slot, which we'll be talking about relatively soon. Anyways, next to the shopkeeper is also the merchant, and the merchant is where you can sell items. Any item that you find on the ground, you can sell to the merchant for money. And obviously, money you can use at the shop to buy a variety of items. Now after you've gotten your stand and you've talked to the shopkeeper, that's when you're going to go talk to Jotaro. When you talk to him, he tells you that he's going to bring you to an obstacle course as well as teach you more about the game. And that's exactly what he does. The obstacle course is very easy, so if you can't clear this, uh, God help you. And when you get past it, there will be an NPC waiting for you. Talk to the NPC and he basically tells you you're going to be fighting an enemy that blocks a lot. This NPC is meant to teach you about block breaking. Because the NPC blocks a lot, if you use your R move as well as your double right click heavy punch, you can break the NPC's block and deal damage. It doesn't take a super long time to take out this NPC, and after you do, you're going to need to fight another NPC. Now there are some minor issues with this quest line where sometimes you'll get stuck in the ring, but fortunately if that happens, the NPC is close enough to the edge that if you finagle it right, you can talk to them again without having to reset and come back. That's what I did here, and then it put me up against the next opponent. This opponent effectively only throws out heavy punches and parryable attacks. The way you parry an attack is you block right before it would hit you. Only certain moves are parryable though, and they're usually ones that block break. That's the caveat. If it breaks your block, most of the time you're able to parry it so that way it doesn't break your block and instead stuns the opponent. Once again, this isn't rocket science. You attack the opponent, when they try to heavy punch you, you parry it. You finish them off and we're moving on to the next step. After talking to the NPC outside again, you'll get teleported back to Jotaro. And after talking to Jotaro again, he'll give you a stand arrow, as well as tasking you with fighting another NPC. This one will actually use their moves though. So now we need to start talking about real combat as well as your skill tree. By this point in the storyline, you'll have gained a fair amount of levels. And so now it's time to figure out where they go. Step number one for your skill tree is to go into the character section and unlock the first vitality upgrade. This upgrade will give you passive health regeneration, which is invaluable for dealing with every single thing in this game. Whether it be PvE, PvP, regardless, the HP regeneration is really important. And without this first upgrade, you can't heal at all unless you pose. Speaking of posing, this is bound to your P key. This is your way of healing out of combat. When you press P, you'll do a random JoJo pose, 
and you'll heal 5 HP per second. It can take a little while to heal all the way back up to full, but when you compound it with the health regeneration node you just bought, it doesn't take that long. Anyways, once you've gotten the vitality upgrade, now it's time to take a look at your stand. The number one thing that you want to get with your stand is destructive power upgrades. These destructive power upgrades will increase the total damage of every move you have on the stand. Most notably, your M1 attacks, which are the most important in this game. So while it might seem like at face value it would be good to unlock a bunch of moves at first, in reality it's a lot better to get destructive power upgrades. Anyways, now that you've gotten vitality and some destructive power, it's time to fight the boss. I say boss, but he's a bit of a pushover. The Chromo Haze boss uses the hand, and as long as you just sort of mash buttons, you shouldn't lose here. Make quick work of this guy, and then you're going to go back to Jotaro. When you talk to Jotaro, he's going to tell you that you need to go talk to an informant in order to get some information on Kira. But before we talk about Kira, it's time to take a quick pit stop. By this point in the game, you've probably been walking around and seeing items. Ideally, you've been picking up those items because you're not brain dead. And if you have been picking up those items, you'll notice that a little pop-up comes up every time you pick up the item. It increases a circle bar and it's got a zero inside of it. This zero is your rank and it's displayed at the top left of your screen all the time as well as when you pick up items. Your rank does four main things. The first is unlock stand storage slots from ranks one to five. The second is to unlock spec storage slots from ranks six to 10. The third is increasing your stand pity all the way up to 0.2 at rank 10. And the final one is that past rank 10, you gain monthly rewards as well as a reset back to rank 10 every rank that you get that's past rank 10. That was a lot of rank 10s, I know. But the point here is that as you've been picking up items, you've probably gotten to the point where your bar is maxed out. And that means that you're ready to rank up. The only small problem is, there's a decent chance that you don't have $5,000 yet, which is something that you need to rank up. So head back to that merchant if you don't have $5,000, get 5k, and then head to the Rank Master Peter on the map. He's on the ocean side, right by Jotaro Kujo Part 6. When you talk to him, he'll let you rank up, and this will unlock another stand storage slot. I say to do this early for two reasons. Number one, because every single item that you pick up after the fact, if it's already maxed out, is going to give you zero rank XP, and that sucks. And number two is, if you want to try to farm for a stand that you want, now you can do that without taking any risks. You can just put away the one you're currently using, and use the rest of your Rokas and Arrows to try to get something that you actually want. That's ranks out of the way. What does the informant have to say? Well, the informant says that they won't give you the information unless you go help out one of their friends with a problem. Said friend is the big noob over in this alleyway. This quest giver gives you repeatable quests to fight against gang members. These gang members aren't particularly hard to beat. They don't have a barrage, so you can barrage them for free, and you can just sort of match M1 since all of their attacks are cancelable. Once again, not hard. Push buttons, and you'll probably win. Once you finish this up, you're gonna head back to the informant. Once you've talked to the informant, they'll give you some more information, and the game will task you with heading back to Rohan. Once you've talked to him, he'll task you with going to talk to Hayato. You'll talk to Hayato, he'll task you with talking to Josuke, and once you've done that, you'll have reached the current final boss. Kira with Killer Queen is a bit of a pushover, but it does give us a chance to talk about your barrage. This is probably the biggest beginner's trap with TCA, and I see a lot of noobs struggling with it. The reason that your barrage seems good is because it's a multi-hit that comes out fast and does a decent amount of damage. But it ends up being bad because if you barrage the NPC, they will always, and I mean always, react to that barrage and barrage you back. It's programmed into their code that if they get barraged, they will barrage back. Now, if you don't barrage them, they can still barrage you, but it's far less likely. And when you're stuck in their barrage, it's gonna do a boatload of damage. Damage that you can't take because usually the boss has significantly more health than you do. And this boss is no exception. So the best way of beating them, once again, is using moves and mashing M1s a little bit outside of their range. As long as you're just outside of that aggro range, the boss likely isn't going to attack you. Or if they do, it'll get canceled right as they're about to use it. Mop up Kira, and we've completed the storyline. This is the point in TCA where things really open up. Well, technically it was before this. See, what I neglected to mention in the beginning, mostly because if someone's looking up a beginner's guide for this game, 
they're probably not that good at the game, which is why they would be looking up a guide to begin with. But what you actually could have done right from the start is fight the hardest boss in the game right off the bat. TCA is great in that it doesn't level lock any of its quests. All of the quests have recommended level requirements above the NPC's heads. And the thing is, if you go up and talk to the quest giver, it'll give you a warning saying, you're under leveled, you probably shouldn't be doing this. But if you know what you're doing, you can say screw that warning and do it anyway. This is why I say that the game really opens up here, because after you've gone through the storyline, you can go to any of the NPCs in the game and fight them. And so if you're looking simply to level up fast, the best way to do it is to fight against the hardest boss. But before we talk about that, the hardest boss isn't the only way to get levels, especially when you're this underleveled. So if you want my recommendation, if you're really new, that would be to go up to the mountain and fight the Giorno boss. This boss is extremely straightforward and easy to deal with comparatively to the Birdman boss, which is the boss that we're going to be talking about fighting in a second. When Giorno is far away from you, he'll shoot his root bullet at you. It's really easy to react and block. He really doesn't have a lot of, or any, oppressive moves to use against you, so if you just, once again, go with the tried and true, mash M1s, don't barrage, use knockdowns every once in a while to get him off of you, you can beat him very easily, very early on. And so, if you're just struggling against the Birdman stat-wise, you can fight Giorno to boost your levels up a little bit so you'll have an easier time. But let's not beat around the bush. The real way to get XP is to fight Birdman. And Birdman is a real pain. Birdman uses Seamoon, and Seamoon has a lot of tools that are hard to deal with when given to an AI. The most notable is Center of Gravity. This is a large AoE blockable move that comes out relatively quickly, and if it hits you, it stuns you in place for a long period of time. Keep in mind that when you get hit by it, you're not stunned for the whole time. You're only stunned for a short duration but you are stuck in place, unable to move. This means that you're still able to attack and block out of it, but you're not gonna be able to run away. And the thing is, Birdman has 750 HP, which absolutely dwarfs your max 300, assuming you even get all the way up there while you're fighting it. So every single trade that you take with the Birdman can be lethal. But we have ways around this. First things first, when you engage the Birdman, the very first thing you want to do is heavy punch them and then walk away. The reason you're going to do this is because they use their ultimate move right off the bat every time. This ultimate move, if it hits you, slows you down as well as speeding up the Birdman, making getting away just about impossible and reducing your ability to win the fight by a large margin. Once they've done this, you can start walking forward and using heavy punches or your double right click. These moves are free damage because of their large hitboxes and the fact that they linger for a decent amount of time. So if you use it and then walk into the enemy, they'll get hit back and you won't take any damage. But the real key here is trying to get the Birdman to use Center of Gravity. Because once he's used it, he doesn't have any other uncancelable moves to stop you from just spamming M1s. The best way I found to deal with it was to hit him with four M1s and then hold block. Usually he'd use it right after the fourth M1, and again, once he's used it, that's when you gotta take that opening. The AI does have to wait for cooldowns. It's programmed in. And because of that, they're not gonna be able to hit you with center of gravity over and over again. So like I just said, if you just hit them with constant M1s after they've used center of gravity, their only uncancelable move is their heavy punch, which if you get hit by it, it's gonna do a relatively small amount of damage and most notably, not gonna directly lead into combos. Now this doesn't mean that the Birdman is super easy to beat even still. If you're not great at the game, or even good at the game, you might still struggle a little bit here. But that doesn't mean that all is lost. There's a little bit of cheese you can do here. If you're really low on health and you're looking to heal, the Birdman struggles with verticality. So if you run over the mountain and climb it a little bit, you can then pose and the Birdman's gonna struggle to get up there and it gives you a little bit of time to regenerate your health but you shouldn't necessarily need that as long as you're keeping track of attacking them when center of gravity isn't available. I should also mention that obviously it's a lot easier to beat the Birdman with larger destructive power stands, so things like Star Platinum, The World, and King Crimson are gonna have an easier time since you can just spam M1 attacks. You do have the option of using your other moves, of course, but usually DPS-wise, it's faster to use M1s than anything else. With that being said, if you're doing this optimally and relatively quickly, 
you can get all the way up to max level 100 very quickly. Comparatively to other games, it is absolutely nothing. For this video alone, when I went back and did it myself, it took me about 30 to 45 minutes in order to get from the very beginning all the way up to max level. And that was also taking some breaks to go around and show you things. Now this is where we finish up talking about leveling, because, well, you're done. You never have to do this again. This isn't like YBA, where if you prestige, you lose all your levels and you need to do it all again. That 30 to 45 minutes is the only leveling you're ever going to have to do when it comes to PvE. But as a beginner, there's some other things that you need to know. So that's what we're going to touch on right at the end of this video here. The first is specs or specialties. If you've been wandering around the map picking up items, inevitably you've probably picked up an item that you need for a spec. As it stands in the game right now, there are four specs. Gun, Brick Battle, Haman, and Vampire. For Brick Battle, you're going to need a linked sword and go over to this NPC in this area of the map. Just like all other specs, you'll need the item as well as $5,000, and then you can unlock the spec. For Haman, you're going to need Zapelli's hat. You'll head over here to Zapelli, no surprise there, and give him his hat back as well as $5,000, and you'll unlock the spec. With Vampire, you'll go back to that section with the informant that you were at earlier, and you'll actually go inside of this little dark area. Inside is Dio Brando, and if you give him a stone mask as well as $5,000, you'll get the spec. And finally, when it comes to gun, if you find a laptop, you can go over to where the gang members are that you once again fought earlier, talk to this NPC, and it'll get you the gun spec. Specs are all but required for PvP and also help out in PvE, mostly because they give you damage reduction. They have upgrades on their skill trees that can get you up to 15% damage reduction. Not only that, but all specs have a true block break. We were talking about parryable moves earlier. These moves block break but cannot be parried. Once again, something that's all but required for PvP, considering that people block a lot, and if you're relying entirely on parryable block breaks in order to break people's block, you're inevitably going to get parried and it's gonna hurt. Now off the topic of specs, there's also chests and keys. Once again, if you've been picking up items, you've also probably stumbled across keys at some point. Keys are exchanged at the Fellow Bun NPC, as well as with $2,000, which will give you a chest. A chest has any number of random items in it. It could be something as relatively unhelpful as a Roka, or as stupid helpful as five gold bars that are each worth one million dollars. You never know what you're gonna get. Now we've talked about Rokas and Arrows already, but there are some stands that cannot be obtained through Rokas and Arrows. Those stands can only be obtained via quest lines from NPCs that you can find around the maps. And those NPCs are as follows. Poochie is on the very far water side in this corner of the map near Jotaro Part 6, and he'll be able to give you a quest to evolve Whitesnake into Seamoon, and then once again give you a quest to evolve Seamoon into Maiden Heaven. Right by Poochie is Weather Report, who is able to evolve Weather Report into Heavy Weather. Jotaro Kujo over here by Zapelli and the Cafe is able to give you a quest to evolve Star Platinum into Star Platinum the World. And finally, on the side of the mountain, is Heaven Ascension Dio, who will help you evolve the world into the world over heaven. Now the thing about all of these evolutions, aside from Star Platinum the world, is that they'll all at some point require you to take on a raid boss. And if you're playing in a public server, you'll have probably already stumbled upon a raid boss portal. The raid boss portals are signified by two things. One, a loud global voice line that you'll hear no matter where you are on the map and two, a marker showing you where the portal is. Now raid bosses are beefed up NPCs that the entire server will fight together. When it comes to actually fighting the raid boss, as long as you're paying attention to your health bar, you're at very low threat of actually dying to one. Usually there's so many people fighting them that if you start getting even remotely low, you can jump out, heal yourself a little bit, and then jump back in. But the thing about raid bosses is that in order to get the item that the raid boss can drop, you need to get 5% of the damage dealt to it. So you have two goals when jumping into a raid boss portal. Number one is get 5%, and number two is do not die. And I say that because if you die at all during the raid boss, you cannot re-enter the portal. So if you're at about 100 health, don't risk it. Heal yourself and then get back in the fight. As for getting that 5%, it's gonna be unsurprising to you when I say that M1s are probably the best way to do it. Because a lot of moves in the game are cancelable, and because people are just mashing attacks like No Tomorrow, it's not really worth going for moves if they're all going to get cancelled. 
Your barrage is a pretty handy tool in order to get damage, but you need to always make sure that you're not trying to barrage the boss while he's getting barraged by someone else. Because if anyone is in a barrage, they can't get hit by any outside sources. It also means that if you see the boss getting barraged, don't bother trying to use any moves on it because you're not going to deal any damage. But if you wait until the boss is not being barraged by anyone else and then go for it, it can be a steady way of getting up to that 5%. When the boss is defeated, you'll get keys as well as rank XP, and if you got to that 5%, you'll also get an item that corresponds with the boss, which you need to evolve any number of stands. But wrapping up talking about raid bosses, and, well, that's about it. Obviously, PvP gets a lot more complex, but this is supposed to be a beginner's guide to sort of give you the lay of the land when it comes to this game. So that's what I aim to do. I hope some of you were able to find this helpful. I'm sure it will massively underperform because well, TCA just underperforms in general, but the goal was to help people, not to have it perform well. So ideally, at least I'll succeed in that goal. But with this video finishing up, if you enjoyed it, you can leave a like, subscribe, tell me in the comments. If you didn't, don't. And with all that being said, have a wonderful day or night wherever you are, and I'll see you next time.